Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome once again to another Sunday morning broadcast by way of Facebook live stream of the New Hope Baptist Church here in Covington, Georgia, another wish of experience. We thank God for you being able to join and to share with us on this morning, and we thank God for another blessed day. Well, it is a special day to me. I had not thought about it, but I was listening earlier to the broadcast uh, from the Union Grove United Methodist Church with my good friend, Pastor Kenneth Norrington, and he was talking about how uh, this day was an anniversary for him as far as uh, his preaching anniversary and being pastor of the uh, Union Grove United Methodist Church, and it reminded me that it is an anniversary day for me, too. 
Uh, this is the second Sunday in July. And on this day, 42 years ago, uh, around about six o'clock in the afternoon, I stood in fear and trembling as a young boy preacher of 17 years old to deliver my first public sermon at the Free Mission Missionary Baptist Church, 2209, I believe is the address, 2229 Florence Avenue in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, I preached my first initial sermon on the second Sunday in July of uh, 1978. I believe that date back then was July the 9th. And so, but I always celebrated on the second Sunday. So it's been 42 years of preaching. And uh, that sermon that Sunday, uh, 42 years ago, was from, uh, I believe it was from Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. And I talked about nothing but leaves. And you know, the ironic thing about that is that in 42 years of preaching and over 3,000 sermons, and I said over 3,000 sermons because I have a record of, of, of that many that I have documented, but I know that there were some years where some of my records were lost, so there were some sermons that were lost and some dates that were lost, uh, but that's, that's uh, over 2,500 that I do have documented, well, over 2,400, rather, that I do have documented, but to my recollection, my recollection I have never preached that sermon again. Uh, there are several sermons that I've preached numerous times, but that first initial sermon, Nothing But Leaves, uh, coming from Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, I have never preached that sermon again. And the Lord has just never not placed on my heart to deliver that message again, not even a variation of it. And so I thought that uh, I find that quite unique. So, wow, today, 42 years of preaching, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a mind-boggling feat. I mean, I started as a board preacher uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, at the Free Mission Missionary Baptist Church, 17 years of age, 42 years ago. Wow. Well, enough of the nostalgic moment. As we pray this morning, we want to be remembering those who stand in the need of prayer. We are looking, we are lifting up uh, the family of Judge uh, Horace Johnson, who was laid to rest on yesterday, you know, that, uh, last week, and we're lifting his family up in our prayers. We're also lifting up uh, Sister Tabitha Ambrose, Ambrose, I believe is her last name, and Brother Chris Avery, uh, their brothers and sisters, and they lost their parents, both of them, their mother and father, in a tragic automobile accident this past week. Uh, and some other relatives, I believe, passed in that accident. Also, four people died in an accident, and two of them were their parents, their mom and their dad, and we are certainly lifting them up. I cannot imagine uh, the pain uh, that they must be going through right now. You know, it's tough to lose a parent, uh, but to lose both parents at the same time is, is, is just beyond my comprehension. Uh, the Lord blessed me, and I, it was always my prayer when I was a child that God would uh, bless me uh, to, be, to be grown before my parents passed, and he did that. Uh, my my uh, I was well out of the house, well grown, had kids of my own before either one of my parents passed. Uh, but uh, it was some time, you know, my mom uh, passed, I believe it was about uh, maybe about 10 or 12 years after my dad died. And so, uh, but for both parents to, to die and be taken suddenly in an accident like that, uh, certainly my heart goes out uh, for uh, Sister Tabitha and Brother Chris and the rest of that family, and we we want them to know uh, that we are praying for them. 
and that we're lifting them up mightily uh, before the Lord. And there's a lot going on still with the uh, coronavirus. Uh, they are debating uh, about kids going back to school. And so let's be prayerful uh, as we deal with that situation, as we deal with that situation about the kids going back to school. I want to remind you now that as, as since we're talking about prayer, I want to remind you of our, of our prayer ministry that, that is happening on every uh, Thursday evening. Every Thursday evening, uh, Minister Miller, Dr. Miller, is uh, spearheading our prayer ministry. Uh, we have a prayer line you can call in uh, with your prayer concerns and prayer requests, and you can call in at that time and just share with us uh, as we pray. Uh, that, uh, that occurs on every Thursday evening from 7 uh, to 7.30 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, and that number is 717-275-8940. And once you call that number, you can uh, get into the uh, prayer uh, session by dialing the access code of 977-3571, followed by the pound sign. Should you have a prayer concern or a prayer request that you'd like to verbalize, and have us pray for and pray with you. Uh, prior to that, you feel free to call 762-499-3411. You can call that any time before 6.45 p.m., anytime before 6.45 p.m. that Thursday, and we'd be more than happy uh, to lift up your prayer concern uh, to the Lord in our prayers. Certainly if there ever was a time when the, the church of God, the people of God, need to be engaged in sincere prayer. I'm not say, I'm not talking about just saying your prayers. I'm talking about really praying. That time is right now. Uh, there are people dying every day. There are people getting sick every day with this coronavirus. Uh, there are other things happening in our communities and in our neighborhoods. It seems as if uh, many of our leaders really don't know which way to go and which way to turn. Certainly we need prayer. And so as we uh, prepare to go to the throne of grace this morning, we ask that you lift up uh, those names that we mentioned earlier of the Horace Johnson family. Lift up Brother, uh, brother Chris and Sister Tabitha as they deal with the uh, sudden loss and making a funeral arrangements for their parents and other loved ones. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come now in the name of Jesus and God, we come, we thank you for just being who you are. We thank you now, Father, for this privilege and this opportunity to just come and uh, bow before you. You said in the word, Lord, that men ought to always pray and not give up. And so God, in spite of how things may look, we are looking to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, knowing, oh God, that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Fathers, we come this morning, we lift up uh, those families that stood around the graveside on yesterday, we lift up uh, the Riley family in Mississippi. We lift up uh, the Johnson family in Covington. And we lift up all those families, God, that we don't even know by name, but they stood around the graveside even on yesterday and they bid a loved one goodbye. There are some, oh God, who, uh, who have uh, uh, appointments with funeral directors in the morning uh, to make uh, uh, arrangements for their loved ones. We pray, oh God, that you just give them strength uh, as they go through this time we lift up uh, Tabitha, we lift up Chris, we lift up uh, the, uh, the Avery family. God, we lift them up that you would just give them strength, Lord, as they deal with this uh, terrible situation. But God, we know that even in the midst of that, that all things are working together for the good, 
to them who love you, who are the called according to your purpose. We, we acknowledge that all things are not good, but we know that all things are working together for the good. And so, God, we just pray now uh, that you would manifest your glory, lift up uh, little brother Abraham in Jackson, Mississippi, as he prepared God to, to go through yet another surgery. Uh, but, God, we know you're a great doctor, and we know, God, that uh, you're able. And Father, those people who are even now in various states around our country who are being inundated by the coronavirus, we pray for our medical workers. We pray, oh God, for our doctors. And then, God, we pray for our political leaders, that you would just give them wisdom, God, that they may not be swayed by their political parties, but they'll be swayed by doing what's right for the people, that your will might be done. Bless us, we pray now, God, in your name. And Father, give us uh, clarity of mind as we seek now to uh, partake of your word and um, bring your word before these, uh, your people who are listening. Give us strength now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. As we prepare for uh, the word today, we just thank God for this, again, this another Preaching opportunity, my God, 42 years. It's, it's mind-boggling. Uh, I, I, I did not know how I could get through that first sermon. And now here we are, uh, over 2,500 sermons later, and God is still blessing. And so we just thank God for that. This morning, we're going to be preaching from the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 and verse 9, and we're going to be talking about when a right is wrong, when a right is wrong, and that text says, uh, reading from the Christian Standard Bible, it simply says, Paul writes, be careful, but be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. Again, Paul writes, he says, but be careful that this stumbling block, that this right of yours, rather, in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. And we want to talk about when a right is wrong. When a right is wrong. In the text for today, the Apostle Paul address the questionable issue of eating meat offered to pagan idols in Corinth. According to the notes that can be found in the ESV study Bible, it says because pagan temples offered parts of animals and sacrificed to, to the gods, they also function as butcher shops and banqueting halls. Sometimes meals for trade gals, clubs, and private dinner parties were held in a temple dining room. Often the meat from a temple was sold in the public marketplace. This section of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, all the way through chapter 11, verse 1, gives clear guidance about the use of such food. Paul first urges the Corinthians not to eat in pagan temples because it might lead to, to, the, to the destruction of a weaker brother or sister. Then he offers himself as an example of giving up something one is convinced is right 
for the spiritual edification of others. He urges the Corinthians not to eat in pagan temples because doing so is idolatry. Finally, he says that eating meat purchased in the marketplace, in the marketplace, which may have come from a pagan temple, is not wrong unless it hinders the advancement of the gospel. Well, when I read this section of 1 Corinthians, I was immediately struck by the similarities between the situation Paul addressed with the Corinthians and the situation we seem to be facing in the United States today. You see, back then, there was an issue with, with the freedom and rights concerning meat. Today, there seems to be an issue with the freedom and rights concerning masks. Now, it's a long way from meat to mask, but there are still some principles that can be extrapolated from what Paul wrote to the Corinthians about eating meat that can be applied to our present issue about wearing masks. For you see, there were some in Corinth who, in spite of what Paul said, insisted they had a right to eat the meat regardless. They insisted it was a matter of their own personal choice and freedom, and they claimed the right to eat as much meat as they wanted. And today, in the midst of our present crisis, there are those who insist they have the freedom and right not to wear a mask. Tukumbo, Adeyabo, and I may be pronouncing his name wrong, but please forgive me. But he writes in the African Bible commentary concerning this verse, this verse, this verse. He says, Paul is here setting out two great spiritual principles. One is that what is safe for one man may be quite unsafe for another. And the other is that no man has any right to claim a right to indulge in a pleasure or to demand a liberty that may be the ruination of someone else. It is that second principle that I want us to focus on for this discussion. No man has any right to claim a right to indulge in a pleasure or to demand a liberty that may be the ruination of someone else. I have discovered that it seems that the main problem with American Christianity is the fact that it is American. Now, what I mean by that is that in many ways, the American spirit hinders American Christians from grasping the authentic spirit of biblical principles as they are revealed in the biblical text. For instance, most Americans have difficulties with comprehending and appreciating the kingdom concepts in the Bible because America is a democracy, or more precisely, a democratic republic. Americans have difficulty accepting kingdom concepts because America was born in rebellion against a kingdom. So America is inherently anti-kingdom. 
Americans have difficulty accepting the authority of a king, even when that king is God. There is a spirit within Americans that rebels against the authoritative, the authoritative measures that they don't have a voice in crafting. That is one of the reasons why some Americans are rebelling against being told to wear a mask. They simply rebel against being told what to do, even when it is for their own good. The anti-maskers say, it is my personal choice. I have a constitutional right not to wear a mask. This is America. This is not a dictatorship. You cannot force me. I will not be forced to wear a mask. Well, when we look around the world and see how other countries are faring in their fight against this virus, we must admit that we really haven't responded as well as others. You see, many have made the mask wearing issue an American political issue when it actually is not. I could see perhaps their, the validity of their point if it was not just if, or if it was just Americans who were wearing masks. If this mask issue, this wearing a mask was just something that happens in America. But you see, people are, are wearing masks all over the world. And so that lets me know that it's not just America. It, it really isn't a, an American left-wing strategy to control people. It really isn't a strategy to make our president look bad because there are people up in China wearing masks. There are people in India wearing masks. There are people in Russia wearing masks. There are people in Britain wearing masks. There are people all over the world wearing masks trying to combat this virus. So this is not an American issue. But we've made it one because our American spirit will not allow us to be told by anybody what to do. But people all over the world are wearing masks as a mitigating tool to help prevent the spread of this virus. The medical doctors and health officials all over the world are basically saying the same thing. Until there is a vaccine, the best measures for containment are practicing social distancing and wearing masks. Now, the countries that have been disciplined enough to follow these practices have significantly lessened their losses of life and economic disruption. But here in the United States, while we brag so often about our leadership, right now we are leading the world in the wrong direction with high rates of infections and death. And much of this is because too many Americans insist on their right not to wear a mask. And they insist upon their right to assemble. And like I said earlier, I would be more understanding of their resistance if America was the only place where social distancing and masks are suggested or being practiced but these measures are being practiced all over 
the world. And so Americans who insist on their right not to wear a mask, for some reason, don't seem to understand when a right is wrong. And so Paul suggested a right is wrong when it causes someone to stumble. In the text, Paul is talking about stumbling in the Christian faith, but the right not to wear a mask and the right to assemble are wrong when they cause someone to stumble, not just so much in their faith, but they call, when they cause someone to stumble in their health. I'm, express, I'm especially distressed to read of all the recent outbreaks that have been traced back to assemblies in houses of worship. Now, I understand. I get it. I, I, I've been pastoring over 30 years. I, I understand uh, the pressure, the economic pressure of maintaining buildings and salaries that many churches and ministries are experiencing because of this pandemic. pandemic. But I also heard Jesus say, I also heard Jesus when he said, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? And so the question the church must ask is, what does it profit to assemble to worship God and experience fellowship when doing so causes so many to experience sickness and death? Or what can we give in exchange for life? Many churches threaten to sue their local governments to get back into their buildings. And what was the basis of their suits? It was the constitutional right to assemble for worship. They indeed did and do have that right. But could it be that right is wrong when assembling contributes to the spreading of the virus? Many claim it's a matter of trusting God. But if they're willing to risk their health to trust God to assemble in the midst of a pandemic, then it seems reasonable that the same faith can be used to trust God to supply finances without in-house meetings. Personally, I think that God just might be using this situation to help us reprioritize. You see, during the past, during the past several years, we have put a premium We've been doing this for years. We, we have been putting a premium on buildings. Maybe the Lord is trying to tell us that instead of focusing on buildings and maintaining, maintaining buildings, we should be focusing on building and maintaining people. Yes. A right is wrong when it causes others to stumble in their faith, as in the text. And a right is a wrong when it causes others to stumble in their health, such as in our current situation. In the same vein, 
A right is a wrong when it destroys what God wants to save. You see, we have spiritualized the Bible so much that we forget that one of the main activities in the ministry of Jesus was making people whole. He healed the sick. He opened blinded eyes. He cured all manner of diseases. With the miracles and with his healings, he demonstrated the power and the presence of the kingdom of God. And we need to understand that the kingdom of God is not just about spiritual health. It is about mental and physical health as well. There's a pervasive Western misunderstanding about the biblical use of the word soul. Most times in the Bible, the word soul is not used in the manner we think it's used. Most times in the Bible, the word soul is not used just to designate the spiritual aspect of a person, but is most often used to designate the whole person. You see, we have, we have put asunder what God has joined together. We, we segment our lives in the spirit over here and, and physical over here. But, but, but God looks at us as whole individuals. And so I want to suggest to you that Jesus didn't come just to save our souls, as we always traditionally say. And when we talk about that, we talk about the spiritual aspect of our lives. Jesus didn't come just to save us spiritually. So Jesus didn't come just to save our souls, but Jesus came to make us whole. For the plan of salvation involves the whole person. There, therefore, we must ask, does the right we insist upon exercising cause injury to what Christ came to save? Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that more abundantly. And the life Jesus was talking about was not life in heaven after death, but he was talking about life on earth before death. So of course we must wrestle with church folks, pastors, deacons. The question we must wrestle with is based on the available information about this virus, do church assemblies promote health and life, or do church assemblies increase the risk of infections and death. And if the latter is true, then the right to assemble is wrong because of the potential to destroy what Christ came to save. And then finally, A right is wrong when it violates the law of love. And so we have to ask, is refusing to wear a mask loving? I would suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, my friend, that wearing a mask is an act of love is, we must ask ourselves the question, is insisting upon the right to assemble in a building in the midst of a pandemic, is insisting upon that right a demonstration 
of love and concern for others, or is it a demonstration of selfishness? In his commentary on verse 8, A.T. Robertson, in his uh, commentary, his word, word studies, or word pictures, word studies of the New Testament, he writes, asousia, and asousia is the Greek word that is translated as right in that verse. He says, asousia means a grant, allowance, authority, power, privilege, right, liberty. He says it shades off easily. It becomes a battle cry. Personal liberty does to those who wish to indulge their own realms and appetites, regardless to the effects upon others. Robertson goes on to comment. He says, now the enlightened, those who know, must consider the welfare. He's talking about this, this deal about meats now. He says, the enlightened must consider the welfare of the unenlightened, else he does not have love. What he's saying now, because see, in that situation in Corinth, Paul has said now that, 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 that the idols are actually nothing. They are, they are of no effect. So that actually when you eat the meat, it's not really sinful because you know that. But if you do not know that to the person who does not, does not know about the idols being nothing, for them to eat meat would be sin. And so the principle he's saying now, if you know that the idols are nothing, and you eat meat based on that knowledge, because you know it's no really big deal, but your eating of that causes the brother who does not know, who is a weaker brother, if it causes that, if it causes that brother to stumble, then you should not eat the meat. So how do we translate that, that principle into our day and time? He's saying, listen, listen, yes, you have the right to assemble. Yes, the Bible does say, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But I don't think the writer was writing about that in the midst. I don't think he had a pandemic in mind when he was writing that. Because the law of love supersedes that. Because if you're right to assemble, and in your assembling, you cause harm or danger to others, then you should forsake your right to assemble. The key is motivation. Why are we doing what we're doing? Later on in the same letter, the apostle would write, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. It does not, listen, it does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Kind of interesting. Love does not insist love does not insist upon maintaining its rights. <laughs> sure. The masks are inconvenient and bothersome. Sure. It, it would have been more fulfilling to have preached this sermon, this very sermon I'm preaching now. It would have been more fulfilling to have preached this sermon from the pulpit in the sanctuary of the New Hope Baptist Church after hearing a rousing number by the anointed voices, the angelic voices, the mass choir, or the male chorus, I would have much rather have heard the familiar chants of amen or say it preacher after making a preaching point. But here I am, sitting at home, speaking into a camera with no idea of who or how many are listening or watching, and why am I doing this this way? Because I love the people of God and I love myself 
too much to play Russian roulette with our lives. In that most quoted text, in the letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul wrote, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. On another occasion, the apostle declared, but we have the mind, but we have the mind of Christ. And what is, what is the mind of Christ? You see, it, it you know, Brother Nunn in his son, the song I always play, he says, it's not enough just to go to church on Sunday morning. And, and I want to add, when we talk about the mind of Christ, it's not enough just to say you're a Christian. You have to display, you have to illustrate, you have to portray the mind of Christ. How can you tell the saints from the ain'ts? The saints portray the mind of Christ. The ain'ts just say, I'm a Christian. But what is the mind of Christ? It is a mind of humility. It is a mind of love. It is a mind of service. It is having an attitude of humility, love, and service. Everything Jesus did, Jesus was not about himself. Jesus did not insist upon having his own way. His whole life was about others. He came for others. He lived for others. He died for others. God raised him from the dead for others. And one day he's coming back again for others. Yes, my friend. A right is wrong when that right causes others to stumble. A right is wrong when that right destroys what Christ came to save. A right is wrong when that right violates the law of love. We will be able to make it through this if we would all devote ourselves to being more loving and considerate of others. The doctors say, the medical experts say, that the wearing of the mask or wearing a mask is not really to protect you, but is to protect other people from you. If that is the case, then my decision to wear a mask my decision to inconvenience myself. My decision is about being considerate of others. It is a decision of whether or not I respect you enough, whether or not I care about you enough, whether or not I love you enough to protect you from me. And vice versa, your decision says a lot about what you think about me. That's why I close with this. As we look at what we're going through, Jesus may be saying to us this. He may be saying, greater love hath no man 
than this, that a man lay down his life. Often when we read that verse, we, we think about dying. But think about it. If the ultimate act of love is to sacrifice your life, then isn't it also an act of love to do the lesser things as well? So maybe Jesus is saying greater love has no man than this. That a man lay down his life, wear a mask. Maybe greater love has no man than this, than that a man lay down his life, maintain social distancing. Maybe greater love has no man than this, than that a man lay down his life, give up the right to assemble for his friends. For you see, my right is wrong if my right causes you to stumble. My right is wrong if my right causes you to be destroyed. My right is wrong if my right is not done in love. When, a, when is a right wrong? A right is wrong when it violates the law of love, when it destroys others, when it causes others to stumble. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, even for right now. We thank you, Lord, for this message. We thank you for this privilege and opportunity. We thank you, God, that even what we're going through today, that there are principles that we can extrapolate from Scripture to show us which way to go, to show us how we should behave, to show us how we should respond. And now, Lord, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would just touch us. For we're so disjointed now. We're so separated now. God, we made this an issue where people are being mean and people are being hateful. When it really, God, is just a matter of common sense and health. And so, God, I pray now that even among your people, you would give us the mind of Christ so that as we go through this situation that we might remember it's not about us, but it's about you. And even our words, even our actions, even our attitudes are a reflection of you. And so help us to be more loving, help us to be more kind, Help us, oh God, so that when people look on us, they won't see us, but they'll see you in us. And when they actually see you in us, we pray, God, that your name will be glorified and that all men will be drawn unto you. Again, God, we pray for your protection. We pray for your mercy. We pray for your grace. Touch, oh God, those who've been afflicted by this disease, this virus. God, we just pray, God, that you just work with the doctors, work with, the, with the, those scientists who are desperately struggling, trying to find a cure, that you give them insight. But God, we know you have the answer. And we're trusting and leaning on and depending on you that everything will work out in your time. This we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, my brothers and sisters. So glad you were able to share with us today. And as we get ready to leave, I want to just pause for a moment to encourage you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. As the Coke commercial says, things go better with Coke. Well, things go much better with Christ. You can make it through this crisis with Christ. 
Because if you allow Jesus to be Lord of your life, not only will he give you wisdom and give you insight, but he'll place his spirit within you. And in that situation, you'll be able to say, greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. And if you have the spirit of Jesus in you, I guarantee you there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing that you will encounter that will ultimately defeat you. Because he is a great conqueror. Paul says we are more than conquerors through Christ. And so that's the hope I have today. That no matter what's going on, no matter what, what President Trump says, no matter what they say in the White House, I know that my king will reign and my king will win. Well, God bless you. I pray that you have a great week this week. Remember now, on Wednesdays, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Lord's willing and the creek don't rise, we will be bringing you a Bible class on the same platform at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. And then the following evening at 7 p.m., uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, call in to the prayer line uh, and just share uh, as we lift up. You know, sometimes people say, that, well, you know, all we can do is pray. I don't agree with that statement. I don't think all we can do is pray. I think prayer should not be a last resort. Prayer should not be thought of as all you can do. Prayer is the greatest thing you can do. For the Bible says, in my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, he says. And he says, I do all that. He says, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land. And I believe that God will bring a change if the people of God would just quit playing church and be real with God, turn from their wicked ways, and really pray God will hear and answer prayer. God bless you. Hope you have a great week. The Lord's willing, hope to share with you again uh, during our uh, Bible class discussion on Wednesday night and during our prayer meeting on Thursday. God bless you. Have a great day. Go with God. And may the peace of God be with you.